Section 24 of The Age of Elizabeth by Mandel Creighton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Book 7, Chapter 2, Elizabethan Literature, Part 2. The great glory, however, of Elizabethan literature are the poets and dramatists. It was in the forms of the imagination that the new spirit of England first found its most congenial expression. Every kind of poetical composition began to advance. To write verses was a necessary accomplishment of every gentleman. No love-making could be carried on without a plenteous flow of amorous verse. The lover sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow is reproduced in all the poetry of the time. Partly the fashion was copied from the sonnets of Petrarch, which were devoted to the expression of changing phases of his pining love for Laura. But the fashionable forms were soon filled with the language of real feeling. The men of Elizabeth's times neither acted nor felt sluggishly. Their full and ardent natures felt and spoke strongly, sometimes in tones of passionate desire, sometimes with delightful fancies which sprung from delicate and tender thought. Sometimes the Elizabethan poets weave a sweet fancy into the rigorous forms of the sonnet. Sometimes they transport themselves and their love from the dull region of common life, and in a realm of faintly imaged peace and simplicity, pour forth their pastoral songs. Sometimes again the memory of old tales of love stirs them to tell again with living feeling the story of lovers' fortunes in bygone times. Amongst these love poets we may notice Sir Philip Sidney, who began to sing his ladies' praises in studied and artificial forms. Gradually he burst through his trammels and learned to be more natural. I sought fit words to paint the blackest face of woe, studying inventions fine her wits to entertain, oft turning others' leaves to see if thence would flow some fresh and fruitful showers upon my sunburnt brain. But words came halting forth, wanting invention's stay. At last the happy revelation came to the laboring student. Biting my truant pen, beating myself for spite, fool, said my muse to me, look in thy heart and write. His sonnets and his songs are full of delicate fancies and express in new and varied imagery the changing moods of his own mind. If Italy taught Elizabethan writers the sonnet as the expression of love, no less powerful was the influence of the Italian epics of Ariosto and Tasso. We have seen how soon these poems were translated into English, where they soon produced a follower in Edmund Spencer whose poem of the Fairy Queen is the great epic of Elizabethan England. Spencer was educated at Cambridge and began life under the patronage of the Earl of Leicester and his nephew Sidney. In 1580 he went to Ireland as secretary to the Viceroy. There he spent almost all the rest of his days, living for the most part at Kilcolman near Cork, where he had received a grant of 3,000 acres of land. In 1598 his house was burned down in Tyrone's Rebellion, and he was compelled to flee to England. He died in London in the following year. Though living in the seclusion of Ireland, he took a deep interest in English affairs. His great friend was Sir Walter Raleigh, whom in his poem Colin Clouts Come Home Again he celebrates as the shepherd of the ocean, while Sidney's untimely death is bewailed in the Elegy of Astrophel. Spencer's poems are all animated by his own religious views. We see in them the force of the early Protestant feeling, the hatred of Romanism as being the source of error, the devotion to Elizabeth as the symbol of England's noblest aspirations. The Fairy Queen is indeed a poem most characteristic of the time in which it was written. Standing on the threshold of the modern time, Spencer took the old forms of the past and breathed into them a new ideal life. Chivalry in its old meaning was past and gone, but its forms of tilts and tournaments and champions and ladies' favors still survived as a graceful amusement at the festivities of Elizabeth's court. The system was not yet forgotten. 
but all the genuine spirit of that system had faded away it was spencer's object to make these dry bones of the past again live with the life of the present the spirit of the new age in religion and politics alike was transferred into symbolical forms taken from the old legends of chivalry in a far distant land where the outlines were dim and faded into a soft dreamy haze the imagination of the poet finally set forth in forms of knights and ladies the altered moral aspect of the world away from the tumult of the world in his quiet retreat under the foot of mole that mountain hoar keeping my sheep among the coolie shade of the green alders by the muller's shore the poet peopled his ideal world with creatures of his own fancy freed from the trammels of reality spencer's imagination draws picture after picture scene after scene without effort or straining after effect he moves easily in the world which he has created, a world far away from daily life, yet not so alien from men's thoughts as to be entirely unsubstantial and unreal. It is a world of lofty enterprise and high endeavor, of ceaseless labor and conflict for a great end. Virtues and vices encounter one another in incessant shock, and the soul of man is ever advancing through repeated trial and effort towards a higher aim yet over all is thrown an air of quietness and peace not the violence of excited emotions but the steady course of the calm yet determined soul is the ideal of spencer hence comes the air of purity and gentleness which is such a distinguishing feature of the fairy queen the poet's self-mastery gives the poem its dignity refinement and grace the fairy queen is the noblest monument of the fine cultivation of elizabeth's age but elizabeth's time is most famous as being the period in which english drama flourished the newborn desire for knowledge turned to man man's life and man's destinies as the most congenial field for its inquiries and the popular taste for dramatic spectacles gave it an open field for its display elizabeth's reign saw almost the earliest beginnings of the drama and saw it reach its highest point in the plays of shakespeare the earliest english comedy which deserves the name rafe royster doister was written in henry the eighth's reign by nicholas udall headmaster of eton it is founded upon the models of latin comedy and deals with the adventures of a gull in his wooing of a rich widow gammer girton's needle written about fifteen sixty supposed to be by john still is almost farcical in its character and treats of the disturbance caused in a small village by an old woman's loss of her needle and the misunderstandings which followed in tragedy thomas sackville lord buckhurst led the way by his play of gorboduc or ferrex and porrex which was acted in fifteen sixty two the story is taken from ancient british history and is concerned with royal jealousy revenge and murder the play is a series of narrations rather than a drama the action is only slightly represented on the stage and each act is preceded by a dumb show to explain its purport it is however in about fifteen eighty six when the excitement of england had reached its highest pitch that marlowe first began to write and was closely followed by green peel nash and shakespeare marlowe green and peel were all of them educated at the university and after many discreditable adventures settled down in london where they led a wild literary life they and a few kindred spirits formed a profligate circle who haunted taverns and were ready to turn their hands to any rude jest or unprincipled trick which might supply them with means to carry on their debaucheries Besides being a playwriter, Green was also a writer of tales, mostly after Italian models. But he has also left some interesting tracks which throw great light upon his own life. On leaving Cambridge, he travelled to Italy and Spain, where he saw and practised such villainy as is abominable to declare. On his return to England, he ruffled out in silks and seemed so discontent that no place would please him to abide in nor no vocation caused him to stay himself in young in years yet old in wickedness 
I began to resolve that there was nothing bad that was profitable, whereupon I grew so rooted in all mischief that I had as great delight in wickedness as sundry have in godliness. He followed through life his idea that what is profitable ceases to be bad. He married and deserted his wife. He rambled here and there, sometimes in a state of maudlin repentance, then relapsing into debauchery as soon as he could get any money by the numerous tales and pamphlets which he hurriedly composed. He died in poverty and misery at the early age of thirty-two, of the results of a surfeit of Rhenish wine and pickled herrings. The life of Green may serve as an example of that of the others. Marlowe is even more unhappy. He was stabbed at the early age of twenty-eight in a tavern brawl. Besides their dissolute lives, Marlowe and Green were both accused of having made open profession of atheism. From such wild and stormy natures it may be supposed the Elizabethan drama found no calm beginnings. In Marlowe, fury, desire, and villainy reached an extravagant pitch of passion. In Tamburlaine the Great, he represents the Tartar conqueror, inflated by ambition and success to a point that almost baffles expression. He rages against God and man alike, and believes he has passed beyond the common lot of humanity. The imagery throughout the play is colossal. I would strive to swim through pools of blood, or make a bridge of murdered carcasses, whose arches should be framed with bones of Turks, ere I would lose the title of a king. In the rich Jew of Malta, human villainy is displayed on the most gigantic scale. The Jew commits every possible crime, even to the poisoning of his own daughter, with fiendish ingenuity and exults in his success. The prologue of the play is spoken by Machiavelli, who is made to lay down the principle, I count religion but a childish toy, and hold there is no sin but ignorance. In his play of Faustus, Marlowe has dealt with the effects of the overpowering desire for knowledge, the thirst for power, the craving to overstep the limits of life to enjoy a few years' intoxication of success at the expense of all the future. We are astonished that a work which shows so much profundity of thought should have been written by so young a man. The desires and interests of an Englishman of that age are set forth in Faustus's exclamation of delight when first he knows that he has power to command spirits. I'll have them fly to India for gold, ransack the ocean for orient pearl, and search all corners of the new-found world for pleasant fruits and princely delicates. I'll have them read me strange philosophy, and tell the secrets of all foreign kings. I'll have them wall all Germany with brass, and make swift Rhine circle fair Wittenberg. I'll have them fill the public schools with silk, wherewith the students shall be bravely clad. I'll levy soldiers with the coin they bring, and chase the prince of Parma from the land, and reign sole king of all the provinces. Yea, stranger engines for the brunt of war than was the fiery keel at Antwerp Bridge, I'll make my servile spirits to invent. We have dwelt upon Marlowe because he is the most characteristic representative of the uncontrolled ambition and inordinate desires which lent force to the adventurous spirit of Elizabethan England. A new horizon had opened before men's eyes. They rushed forward with unbounded delight to take possession of their new realm, and in their first excitement hurried off in chase of what was most marvellous, most strange, and most monstrous among the novelties which had been revealed. In the region of the imagination, Marlowe delights in elevating human nature to superhuman proportions. Not the orderly array of life, nor the fine motives of action attract him, but he rushes forward to depict the almost unimaginable extravagance of fury, villainy, and desire. Yet Marlowe is a great dramatist. His imagery is forcible, his fancy vivid, his pictures of human passion real though exaggerated. There is the stamp of genius on everything he wrote, and his faults are of the kind that would have been tempered by age. In plot and action, in his views of scenic effect, Marlowe was a great advance upon his predecessors, 
and when compared with his contemporaries appears as a true dramatic artist about the time when marlowe's earliest play appeared william shakespeare first came up to london he was the son of a well-to-do tradesman in stratford-upon-avon whose fortunes however had begun to decline during his son's boyhood at the early age of nineteen he married anne hathaway who was eight years his senior increasing poverty and as the story goes a disturbance about poaching in sir thomas lucy's park drove shakespeare to quit stratford leaving his wife and family behind and induced him to try his fortunes in london he arrived there at the age of twenty-two and became an actor we cannot trace with any certainty his life in london nor how he became a poet his earliest work venus and adonis the first heir of his invention was dedicated to the earl of southampton who was always his constant patron soon he began to try his hand at writing plays at first comedies which turned upon the fashions of the day love's labours lost one of his earliest plays was a piece slight in plot ridiculing the folly of euphuism and pedantry the comedy of errors was an adaptation of latin comedy and aimed at amusing by its broad complications rather than any study of character in a midsummer night's dream first of all the poet's fancy broke forth unrestrained his pictures of fairyland are full of graceful imagination and gain force by the contrast between the airy gambols of the elves and the clumsy clowns who labor at their rehearsal we do not know how shakespeare learned and wrote nor do we know with certainty the order of his plays they were written most of them to order the theatre possessed an acting copy of some old story legend or history these shakespeare wrought up some he entirely transformed with his own power others perhaps he only remodelled and wrote in parts dramatic representations of english history were highly popular and shakespeare's historical plays are deeply interesting as showing how the english at that time looked back upon the stirring events and characters of their country's past shakespeare wrote quickly to supply the demand of the playhouse his fame soon grew and elizabeth listened to his plays with interest he is said to have written the merry wives of windsor to gratify the queen who wished to see falstaff in love his plays were at first published but when his fame was secure he seems to have stopped their publication that he might make more money from their representation after sixteen hundred hamlet and king lear were the only two which were published during his lifetime though famous in london shakespeare seems never to have lost his affection for his native place his gains were not all spent in the delights of society though he supped at the mermaid tavern among the wits of the time he invested his money in the purchase of land near stratford in shakespeare genius was not a wild excitement as it had been to marlowe order and self-control were characteristics of his greater penetration into the meaning of life his insight and depth of feeling led him to care and prudence not to mere excesses he retired from london to spend his last years in ease and comfort at stratford where he died in sixteen sixteen at the age of fifty-two it is impossible to explain a genius like shakespeare by any features of the times in which he lived or to point out the sources from which he gained his experience or knowledge analysis and criticism can only discover they cannot explain profound truths fine points of perception discrimination in details which the poet's imagination saw in their entirety and depicted as it saw treatises have been written to prove shakespeare's special knowledge of various subjects and to claim for him a technical training in each it is impossible to identify shakespeare with any of his characters or to say that any special mood of the human mind was peculiarly his own he is equally at home in the scheming villainy of richard the third and the chivalrous bravery of henry v in the consuming jealousy of othello and the complacent sensuality of falstaff in the reckless wit of mercutio and the absorbing revenge of shylock in tragedy and comedy alike he is supreme 
his master hand swept with unerring accuracy over the entire scale of human life and passion as he advanced in life we find in his plays greater thoughtfulness and a more serious tone in the merchant of venice he takes a deeper view of the varied course of life in a short while how great a change has come imperceptibly over the life and fortunes of so many as you like it shows still further the poet's thoughtfulness he grapples with the contradictions of life sweet are the uses of adversity while the cynical moralizings of jaques and the quaint practical wisdom of the clown give opportunities for setting in sharp contrast the different solutions of life's problem in hamlet shakespeare has drawn the struggle of man's spirit with destiny the conflict of the soul with its surroundings the terrible force of sin to perturb the life of the innocent so profound is the insight which dictated hamlet that it still remains an inexhaustible subject of speculation opening out innumerable problems of human life and character shakespeare's range of interest was endless amongst the last of his plays was the tempest in which he seems to have caught the curiosity awakened by travellers tales and to have pressed forward in fanciful speculation to consider the origin of man's nature the monstrous form of caliban half human half brutal goes with a soul that has but the lower animalism and selfish cunning of the brute for its foundation the tempest like a midsummer night's dream is worked out with supernatural machinery again we are in the region of spirits but the spirits of shakespeare's age differ from those of his youth no longer are they in the foreground working spontaneously and showing now and then their interest in men's fortunes they are now kept under man's sway controlled by his will and compelled to work at his command in both plays the poet's imagination overpowers us and peoples the fairy region with shapes which become almost real to us but the sprightly play of youthful fancy the unfettered gaiety of heart which clothed the world with the fair colours of a beautiful dream have given way to the reflective wonder of age which peers into questions it cannot solve the airy grace of a midsummer night's dream changes into the stately dignity of the tempest with greater knowledge has come greater uncertainty on the conscious enjoyment of power follows the sense of its bitterness like the baseless fabric of this vision the cloud-capped towers the gorgeous palaces the solemn temples the great globe itself yea all which it inherit shall dissolve and like this insubstantial pageant faded leave not a rack behind we are such stuff as dreams are made on and our little life is rounded with a sleep in shakespeare the glory of the elizabethan drama was at its height his youth saw the wild extravagances of the genius of marlowe in his later years he saw a new race of dramatists arise webster ford massinger chapman middleton johnson beaumont and fletcher they were all men of force and power though none had the range or the profundity of shakespeare johnson is the most famous of them and is remarkable for taking the subjects of his comedies from the domestic life of his own time he was a scholar proud of his learning and wished to introduce a severer style of composition than the untrammelled freedom of shakespeare the drama continued to thrive in england until the severer morality of the puritans revolted against the license into which it began to fall under the writers of james i's time and the theatre declined before the feverish excitement which preceded the times of the great rebellion end of section twenty four